Let's go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. And uh, we continue to read through the New Testament. So I believe this week we'll be starting in the book of Hebrews. So we're not reading Matthew to Revelation, kind of jumping around here and there over the Gospels, a little bit of Hebrews or the Epistles and whatnot. So uh, I believe it's Hebrews that, that is next. So, uh, so this Wednesday we'll actually be looking at um, among other passages, Hebrew chapter 4, and its emphasis on rest, that we find our rest ultimately in Jesus and its connection to the seventh day. So uh, we'll, we'll have a lot to say about the opening chapters of the book of Hebrews within the next seven days. We're in Acts chapter 7 and looking at a story that I think we've all read and we all make the same jokes, but we all want to know why is it in the Bible to begin with, right? Uh, so let's see what we can come up with. Acts chapter seven, uh, chapter 20, we'll begin in verse 7. So if you will, stand with me in reverence for God's word. <coughs> Luke the evangelist writes under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we were gathered together to break bread. Paul talked with them. 
intending to depart on the next day and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man you named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. They took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as always, we, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our hands, our feet, that we are transformed by the renewing of the mind of the work of the gospel. And may we take a text like this and see why you gave it to us and why it should transform our lives. And Lord, may I decrease so that you can increase. In the name of your son we pray. Amen. Be seated. In 2006, there was a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. A year later, uh, the diagnosis turned terminal. And he would eventually uh, die in July of 2008. He is most remembered for his last lecture. There he gave a positive, upbeat, encouraging lecture to his students about his field, about life, about facing death. That lecture was eventually turned into a book simply titled The Last Lecture, and it went on to be a New York Times bestseller. I remember uh, in preparation of a sermon many years ago, um, I read the book, actually listened to the audio book, and uh, uh, not a Christian book or anything, but it, it's very well written and whatnot. And, but what I do remember in the book most memorably is there's a scene where he's, he's trying to figure out what this, this diagnosis, this terminal diagnosis means for his children. And so he, he is encouraged by a doctor or a friend or someone to actually record um, him speaking to his family that they would play after he passes away. So as his kids reach important milestones of, their, uh, uh, of life, he would record what he would like to say to them. And about every day he would sit down and, and spend a few minutes talking to his wife, talking to his children knowing that soon he would not be around to say these things. Well, they did precisely that. He died in July of 2008, and his family still have those videos today. I couldn't help but wonder, ever since I read that, is what would I record on such videos like that? What is it that I would say to my family? But then there's another question in the light of this text. How brief would you be in videos like that? If he had but one last lecture to give, one more conversation to have with people you will never see again, how long would you keep talking? That's the situation Paul finds himself in. This is the last time he will see the people of Troas. And no wonder then, knowing that he would likely never see them again, he cannot stay stuck within a 30-minute time frame. And as a result... He finds himself going on and on because there's so many things he wants them to remember. So many things he wants them to grasp before he says good goodbye. Now, this passage is a humorous passage because of the stereotypes, right? We've all fallen asleep in church because preachers are boring, right? I mean, let's, 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 let's be honest, right? We've all had that, 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 that situation happen to us, to a family member. We've all had to elbow people. We've all snickered when we heard someone else snore, right? We, we laugh at this passage because of the stereotypes. Now, Paul confesses throughout the New Testament, particularly in his uh, letters to the Corinthians, he wasn't a very good speaker. In fact, let me give you a few examples here. 2 Corinthians 11, even if I am unskilled in speaking, right? That's a nice way to say I'm not a good preacher, right? I mean, that's an eloquent way of saying that. He, he failed preaching class. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and, but not with words of eloquent wisdom. He says, I've been called to preach. And the good news is God calls us a lot of different people to preach, even people who aren't good at it. He calls the preach, right? In fact, if, if you study history, the, the, most, uh, the, uh, the, most, uh, the greatest sermon ever preached on American soil was not by Billy Graham, a good preacher. It was by Jonathan Edwards, who was monotone, as sinners in the hands of angry gods. Monotone, stood up, read manuscript, 
right? That boring guy, like we would consider him boring today, changed America in the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians 10, for they say, right, this is what they say of Paul, his critics, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. In other words, he's not a bad writer, and when he writes, he lets us have it. But when he shows up here, eh, there's a lot to, to be desired, right? You know, he, he's not going to get his own radio show or television show for preaching. Yet, as we will see, this passage here is about more than a warning about sleeping in church. It's really about sleeping in life. Notice the, the in order to see it, we, we, we've got to understand what Luke is doing here. Again, whenever we read a passage like this, it's not as if Luke thought, you know what would be a funny story if we put it right here. I would just recall that story about the dude who fell out of the window because he fell asleep. Right? I'm just going to put it right here, right? No, no, no. Luke has actually accomplished something. I think that you'll find this helpful. This is a great way to read Scripture. Um, you'll see that Luke provides some, some symmetry. I don't know if you can see that or not. But, but what it says here is you, you've got Peter right here. You've got Paul right there. What you'll find is symmetry between the, those two apostles, right? Peter dominates the narrative in the first half. Paul dominates the narrative in, in the second half. So what you'll see is, is in uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches his first sermon. In Acts chapter 13, Paul preaches his. In Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter heals a lame man. Acts chapter 14, Paul heals a lame man. Acts chapter 8, uh, Peter deals with Simon the sorcerer. In Acts chapter 13, Paul deals with Elemas the sorcerer. In Acts chapter 5, you remember that it was Peter's shadow that people would be healed. They were just in his shadow. Well, the parallel of that, Acts chapter 19, uh, you remember that a handkerchief of Paul's gets touched by someone who's sick and they are healed. In Acts chapter 8 is the laying on of hands, right? They do that for Peter. They do that for Paul in the church of Antioch in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 10, Peter is worshipped. Well, the same thing happens in Acts chapter 14 with Paul. In Acts chapter 9, Tabitha is raised. Well, as we see here, Acts chapter 20, Eutychus is raised. Finally, in Acts chapter 12, Peter is in prison for his faith. In Acts chapter 28, we see Paul in prison. For his faith. It's fascinating how, although it's not perfect symmetry, it's symmetry nonetheless. And so, in order to, to, to appreciate what Luke is doing here, it's just not an accident he put it there. It's, it's part of the story he's telling that whether the gospel is going to the Jews or the gospel is going to the Gentiles, we talked about this last week, it's the same gospel. And God called someone who does the same thing in both regions. And they accomplish in many ways the same thing. So let's look at the setting to begin with, the setting of this passage. Now, the setting of the scene is worship. That's part of the joke, right? They're having church. And a guy falls asleep at church, right? We, we get this. Now, what is significant is that in the book of Acts, we get insight into what their worship looked like. Right? What is it that they did in a regular worship service? Well, the first thing we, we see here is uh, that it was, yeah, it was Sunday. Now, it's in the very first, uh, or verse 7, we should say, first verse of our passage, on the first day of the week. Now, if you had a calendar in front of you, you Gen Zers, millennials, just pull out your phone. You'll have a calendar in front of you. And one of the things you'll find is that Saturday is the Sabbath, Sunday is the first day of the week, right? It's, it's, I'm not, I'm probably insulting all of our intelligence here, right? But what is it we find the Christians doing the first day of the week? Worshiping. By the way, that's a work day in ancient Rome. It's a work day. It's a work day for the ancient Jews. Why? Because you, you take Saturday off, not Sunday. But what are the Christians doing? They're worshiping on Sunday. It's striking, isn't it? I think this is evidence for the resurrection. How do you explain um, uh, lifelong, faithful, circumcised Jewish men suddenly changing the calendar by which they'd worship from Saturday to Sunday? What explains that? Well, I think the resurrection does. Well, this is exactly what we have here. Christians worship on Sunday because Jesus was raised on Sunday. We'll talk about this upcoming Wednesday. We look at the seventh day, the day of rest, that, that Jesus is executed on Friday. He rests literally on Saturday, and he begins a new creation on Sunday. It's a retelling of the creation story right there in the resurrection account. So Christians begin that, that, re that resurrection story, that creation story, on Sunday. This is the day of worship. We begin our week in worship. We don't end our week in worship. The second thing we, we see here is the breaking of bread, right? On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, right? You see the breaking of bread. Now, this is um, 
common in the book of Acts to where when the church gathers, they celebrate the ordinances. Baptism is all over the book of Acts, uh, but so is the Lord's Supper. Now, I do think there's a double meaning here to breaking of bread. To break bread is to share a meal. I, I, we would use that phrase occasionally even today. It also means a specific meal, the Lord's Supper. I think here it likely refers to both. We get hints of this in the New Testament. It becomes a major issue uh, uh, in the age after the apostles. What the early church would often do is that they would share a communal meal within the church where everyone would, would have potluck, right? And they'd go back in the fellowship hall, and as part of that meal, they broke bread. They, they, they celebrated the Lord's Supper, right? We gathered together to fellowship because of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. It was known as the agape meal. Or the love meal. It later was described as a love feast. And that is why in the age of the apologists, the age after the apostles, uh, Christians were accused of, of, of incest. Right? Because they celebrate what they called love feasts, agape meal, while calling each other brother and sister. Oh, and they were cannibals because they were eating someone's body and drinking their blood. Right? I mean, these were the accusations made against Christians. And you thought being called a bigot was bad. Right? But here we see them, they're breaking bread. They're enjoying one another's company and fellowship. The third thing you see there is preaching. Now, the genesis of our understanding of preaching is the New Testament. It shows up in the Old Testament. Nehemiah stands up and preaches, right, whenever they all arrive in Jerusalem. But really, our understanding of preaching is developed in, in, in the New Testament. Uh, and our theology of preaching comes in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit descends in Acts chapter uh, uh, 1. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up to to preach. And so we see that apart from the preaching of the word of God, there, there can be no, no church, no, no real worship is, is accomplished. Well, this time, however, Paul's sermon went a little long. Now, when we think of a preacher going too long, we, we probably think uh, that they, they went over the 30-minute allotment. But if you study, uh, study stuff like this, you'll find that's not the case at all. If you want to know if you have been affected by your culture, consider that whenever Abraham Lincoln and Douglas went around to travel with their debates, right? They debated issues from, from the role of government to slavery to, to, to the expansion of the Union, all that sort of stuff. What would often happen is that, let's say Lincoln started. He would go for an hour. Douglas would respond and go for an hour. No intermission, no breaks, no comfortable pews. And in one situation, when Lincoln stood up to rebuttal the rebuttal, he told everyone, it will take me too long for me to respond to Mr. Douglas. Y'all go home, have a sandwich, come back. It'll take me at least two hours. And people would sit and listen to it. If you were to read the old newspapers, what you'll find is entire speeches in newspapers, right? What you get now is cliff notes, okay? It's, it's very brief, ain't a whole lot going on around here. Well, back then, you'd have entire speeches. Spurgeon would, would, would publish his sermons in the local newspaper. If you want to know what Spurgeon's up to, because your preacher's not as good as him, you can still go to your church and make him think you like him. But then the next day, you can read Spurgeon's sermons right there in the comfort, comfort of your home. So think about it, that people would, would sit for an hour and listen to someone talk. Well, nowadays, we're so bored even when the TV is on, right? When I watch basketball, I don't watch it the second it's live. I wait till at least halftime because I'm tired of watching uh, timeouts, media timeouts, checking the monitor, and free throws. There's no reason why a 40-minute game takes two hours. Yet another reason why soccer is better than everything else. You know the game's going to end in under two hours. You just know it, right? Because the clock doesn't stop. That's the way it ought to be. But I, I digress. Well, one of the things we need to note here is that Paul did go longer than he normally would have gone. In fact, the text says that he went beyond midnight. Now, just pause there. When we think of the word midnight, we think of just 12. That's all it means. But it's not the middle of the night, is it? Can I tell you why it's not the middle of the night for us? Electricity. <laughs> right? I mean, with electricity, we were, able to, we were able to stay up into the night. Well, back then, that wasn't the case. You didn't have, a, a, you know, adult night lights that we call street lamps. You didn't have that stuff, right? You, you couldn't leave your, your lamp on in the middle of the night because you're, you're trying to finish the paper or you're, you're trying to do this or that or, or whatever it is you're doing at 11 o'clock at night. No, you went to bed with the sun for the most part, and you got up with the sun, right? And in the middle of that night, particularly in pioneer country, you got up middle of the night to put more wood on the fire so your family wouldn't freeze. 
midnight had a meaning here, right? And Paul goes past midnight. Everybody else is asleep. There's the Christians still listening to this guy talk. Bless their hearts, right? You, again, you, you thought you, you had it rough. Well, that's the setting. Let's turn quickly to the slumber here. Now, verse 8, uh, we, we find that there were many lamps in the upper room where they gathered. Now, as the congregation gathers to worship, Luke tells us something unique about this setting. There were many lamps, right? You don't have fancy light bulbs. Uh, there's, there's, there's nothing like that, right? You, you, what you got at best are torches, right? Lamps. And that's how, that's, that's, that's how you're going to be able to see at night. If Paul's going to read scripture, he's got to have some source of light. And this is how they're going to do it. Now, what a lot of scholars think Luke is doing is he's trying to get Paul off the hook. You see, what happens in verse 8 is it goes from... Paul bored this guy literally to death, okay, <laughs> to all of a sudden is, well, it wasn't just Paul who's long-winded in his preaching. It's the setting by which this took place, right? So, so we see the lamps, right? And they're sucking, in, sucking out all the oxygen of, of the room, right? But notice that a young man named Eutychus was sitting at the window. Now, we, we get a hint of perhaps what's, what's going on here. Um, have, you, uh, have you ever been camping... And after looking at the fire, you know, you're swapping manly stories, whatever it is you're doing, you know, and, and you eventually, you start to doze off. There, there's something about that campfire and the setting and it's dark and the crickets and all that. If, if you're from the city, you won't be able to sleep with the crickets. But if you're from the country, that is the way you go to bed, right? You, know, you don't need sounds of rushing waves playing on, 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 on your phone, uh, which, which you got crickets, and they're glorious, right? It's, it's awesome. That's one thing I remember about moving to, to Louisville uh, when I went to college. You can't hear, hear no crickets. Well, or maybe what you've had is uh, uh, you're driving down the road. Everyone else in the car is asleep. Not that that ever happens <laughs> with us. But you're driving down the road. It's late at night. You're getting tired. What do you do? You can't crank the radio while everyone else is asleep. And, and your wife won't approve of that, right? And your kids will never forgive you. What do you do? You start to roll down that window. Look at me like... like some uh, Gen Xer. You don't roll windows down like this anymore, do you? It's ding. Right? Reminds me of a comedian who complained that he missed the old days of a phone. When he got mad, you could slam the phone down. What do we got now? Ha! Right? That's all you got. Right? You, can't, you can't hang up the phone in anger. Not that you should ever be angry. I'm just saying. Right? But anyway, so, so you, see your roll, you roll down the window, and it takes forever with these cars. And what do you do? You stick your head out. Right? You're trying to stay away. Guess where this guy is sitting? Next to the window. Something tells me in the middle of, of this long sermon, which you're probably feeling that you're going through right now, is, is he's just going through the pews, right? I got to get to this window, right? I'm going to die in here. And come find out he, he didn't die in there. He, he got out, out there, right? So I, I do think Luke is trying to get Paul all, all, off the hook here. Because you got to wonder, was anyone else falling asleep, right? The, the lamps are there. And he has to sit next to the window to, to stay awake. Well, uh, I, I, and then despite his, his best efforts, he, he succumbs to sleep. He, he falls asleep. A young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. <laughs> right? She just, Luke, right? This is my guy. I'm going to poke him there. Um, I remember the second time I ever preached. It was the same sermon as my first sermon because it it took me like six months to come up with a sermon. Okay, I mean it, it literally did. I still remember I wanted to preach and my pastor said, "Okay, in six weeks I want you to preach." And I said, six weeks? I mean that's kind of fast, ain't it? It never crossed my mind that our pastor is doing that at least three times a week, right? And and so I remember worked really hard on it. Uh, you, you won't believe this, but I could not go over 15 minutes. It didn't matter how hard I tried. I thought I exhausted the issue. I preached on friendship, right, from Proverbs. And, and I thought I'd read every verse in the Bible, said everything there was to say, and I was done in 15 minutes. I know you were jealous. But one of the things you've noticed with a lot of our young ministers we've had come through here is they all do the same thing for a sermon. They all do that. And what you find is their last sermon isn't that, right? It, we're all cursed with it. It just comes with the territory, right? You just get longer and longer as, as you go. But I remember that second sermon as well. It's the same as my first, except now it was in the nursing home. I've now discovered I think my pastor just 
give up on nursing home to preach, so he made me do it, and uh, it'd be good for him. Um, so I, I went and preached, and, and uh, uh, we, 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 we had a hymn book, and our song leader went, and we sang all the songs in the hymn book that had the word friend in it, you know, what a, what a friend we have of Jesus, right, and all that sort of stuff, and, and I'd never done anything like this before, and I hadn't been in a nursing home very often in my life, so I'm just giving it to them, trying to get them all saved, and half of them fell asleep. I remember afterwards, my father was just livid, right? My father just says, it is so rude of these, uh, of these elderly people to disrespect a young man who feels a sense of calling to the Lord, right? He just went on and on and on about how just rude it is all these people fall asleep. Well, um, I, I've since learned that's okay, right? I mean, it's just, it's, I've done a lot of preaching in nursing home. I haven't done a whole lot of here in Frankfurt. But I think every young preacher should, should learn to preach in a nursing home. Because it isn't just the sleeping you have to deal with your congregation. It's those who are awake you have to deal with, right? I mean, to be honest, there's so many distractions in a nursing home. It, it is absolutely incredible. And I've seen a little bit of everything. I still, this is free, I still won't forget the, uh, the, the, the lady from the nursing home who answered her cell phone. Don't take this the wrong way. I didn't think any of them knew what a cell phone was, right? And cell phones were still kind of new. Like the iPhone I had just come out. And she's out there answering a cell phone, talking on it in the middle of the sermon. And she's hard hearing. So she's talking really loud on the cell phone, middle sermon, right? So the sleeping I've learned is, isn't the problem. Uh, it's, it's those who are still awake. But where I served at before, there was a guy who, who drove an hour and a half every Sunday morning to, to uh, lead us in Sunday school. He was the Sunday school director. He had a fantastic job. He has since passed away, uh, passed away shortly after we, we moved to Frankfurt. And um, um, he, he would fall asleep five or ten minutes in the sermon every Sunday morning. Right? And no one condemned or anything. We, he was a faithful, long-time member of the church group in the area. Just loved Jesus, but had gotten up early. Uh, you, you lose an hour. Uh, I guess you, you gain an hour coming down. You lose an hour going back. And uh, so, so we, we never said anything to him. He always fell asleep. I, I, I remember one professor telling us he, he pulled a joke on, uh, on one of his students who kept falling asleep in class. He was kind of tired of it. So he, 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 he got all the other students involved. He says, next time, you know, Bob goes to sleep, we're all going to get up quietly. You're going to leave your stuff at your desk. And we're all going to uh, step outside. There's going to be a loud noise. If he wakes up, he's going to look around, and he's going to think the rapture happened. <laughs> you know, and that, that taught him a valuable lesson about falling asleep. Well, unlike stories we, we like to tell about falling asleep at unfortunate times, this nap that Eutychus takes is deadly. It's ironic because Eutychus means uh, fortunate. And on this day, he ain't very fortunate. Falls asleep at the wrong time in the wrong place. It cost him his very life. Um, I still remember a, uh, my preaching professor. He's, I think he's in Tennessee now. Um, he told a story that he was in mid-sermon and a guy had a heart attack in the church. And as fascinating as that story was, I wanted to know the answer to one question. What would you do after the ambulance came and, and, and took the member of your church? I, mean, I have no idea what the appropriate response is. Do you go back and worship? Do, do you just call it a night? What do you do? He goes, oh, I got back in the pulpit and picked up where I left off and finished the sermon. <laughs> like, good for you. I, I, don't, I don't know what the proper answer is to that. but That's kind of what Paul does here, isn't it? A guy falls out of the window and he's dead. Brings him back to life and what does he do? Goes back, finishes the sermon. I guess he was still on the uh, fourth alliterated point he had. But notice that despite this tragedy, Paul does raise him. Again, that, that corresponds with the raising of Tabitha that Peter did. So there in verse 10, Paul went down and bent over him and, and taking him in his arms says, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. A couple points to notice here. First of all, Eutychus really is dead. Right? For one, there's, there's parallels between Eutychus and Tabitha. Tabitha was really dead. Eutychus, the parallel, is really dead. Secondly, I think Luke knows the meaning of the word dead. He's a doctor. And by the way, did you notice that Luke is there? Starting in chapter 20, you start seeing the word we everywhere. We got on the boat. We went to church. And, I, and, and we were listening to Paul go on and on and on. And we were there when Eutychus died. We, 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 we. You see it there in, in chapter 20 in verse 1 and 2, right? That, that we were in Troas. Later, they, we get on the boat. And what you'll find starting in chapter 20 going all the way to chapter 28, that, that Acts reads as much like a traveling journal as, as it does anything else because Luke becomes the primary witness. Luke is there. And so if you'll read, say, the, the shipwreck of Paul, you'll find there is 
unnecessary detail all over the place. It's very detailed. He describes the boat. He describes the crew. He describes the waves. He describes how long it took. All this stuff. But he's not that detailed everywhere else. Why? Because Luke is there. So Luke, you can imagine, goes down there. He checks the, the guy's pulse. He says, Eutychus is dead. He is dead. He is really dead. But the second thing we need to see in this passage is, the fam is, is that this passage should sound familiar to us, right? That phrase, uh, do not be alarmed, is striking. Because if we were to go back to, to, I believe it's Mark's gospel, you'll find the same phrase from the angel. He says, do not be alarmed, the angel says to the women at the empty tomb. He is risen. Paul, picking up that language, says, do not be alarmed. His life is in him. And this is typical in, in the Bible that these re resuscitations are a picture of the resurrection to remind us of the power of the gospel. The third thing we need to notice here is how much like Elijah and Elisha Paul, uh, Paul looks like here. You know the stories, right? We looked at the story of Elijah a year or so ago. That, that in their uh, resurrection accounts, Elijah and Elisha are the first to do so in the Bible. Elijah and, and Elisha actually lay down upon the deceased, and they cry out to God. Paul here, you can see him uh, 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 not comforting the family, not caught in ambulance, but he, 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 he goes down upon the man. He wraps him in his arms. He cries out in prayer, and the, and the young Eutychus, fortunate, is, is raised. But the most striking part of the story to me is, as I've already said, is not about Eutychus falling to his death or even being raised. But Paul finishing what he started, verse 11. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so depart. It's almost as if they said, Paul, we'll let you finish. Can we do dinner? It's 1 o'clock in the morning now. You know, we, 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 we kind of forgot dinner because you, you won't stop talking. All right? But they go back up and, and they return to worship, and rightly so, because what they witnessed was a genuine miracle. And as verse 12 says, they were greatly comforted, or they were not a little comforted. That is to say, they were very, very comforted. Why? Because they had witnessed the power of God in the presence of his church through his messenger, Paul. So what is striking is that it isn't until the miraculous work of God, one of the things worth, worth noting here, is that it isn't until Eutychus is raised that we have the church celebrating the Lord's Supper. I think there might be something there. First comes rest restoration. Then comes community. I think that is the miracle of grace to this day. First comes restoration. Then comes Fellowship. Well, what, what do we do with this passage, right? It's a goofy story. We, we, we can have fun with it all day long. What do we do with this passage? I just want to emphasize a few things here, um, and maybe we'll, we'll stay late. Uh, it didn't seem appropriate, right? You know, we went a little long. First of all, I think we see the beauty of the church here, the beauty of the church. Um, I want you to go back up in chapter 20, verse 3. I just want to highlight something for you. Remember, every text or that context, pretext or proof text. Verse 3. There Paul spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return to Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, Secundus, and, Ga and, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. Are you asleep yet? How often do we skip this sort of stuff? Oh, a bunch of people travel with Paul, don't know who they are, doesn't matter. Move on. We do the same with genealogies, don't we? Well, one of the things that we, we should notice here is Paul is on a sort of farewell tour. And he knew what awaited him in Jerusalem. It's bad enough when he's with the Gentiles, the Jews come after him. What will happen when he gets to Jerusalem? And at each stop of this farewell tour, we, we get insights into the beauty of the local church. Behind each of these names is a story. And one of the stories we see here is that though the world hated Paul, they loved Paul because of the local church. Paul has planted this church and that church. It's going to leave here. It's going to go there. It's going to... But everywhere Paul went, what he found was believers of the local church who he knew loved him. What a beautiful picture we have of the church here. We have an entire congregation in worship in the passage that we're reading. 
And what is it that they are doing? They are celebrating. They are welcoming in one of their own, celebrating what God is doing in their midst, in fellowship with one another. They're living life together, and they are there together. And they are with one another. It's a body of believers. This is the beauty of the local church. They've gone through much together, yet they have gone through much as a church together. Second thing I think we see here is our tendency of being present but still missing out. By the way, if, if you wanted to know, someone with the Kroger this morning took a picture of the Sunny D. Uh, How did I know that was going to happen, right? Let me tell you where it is. It's where the milk is. I looked. I knew it would be there. But I still missed out. That's a man problem, isn't it? You guys ever say, honey, if you'll go over to the third shelf on the far left, it's bright yellow. Ah, honey, I just don't see it. It's not here. You walk up, there it is on the third shelf, far left, bright yellow, boom, right? We men, we, 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 we can see it, but be blind to it, right? Much like that, that's Sunny D. It isn't just a man problem, is it? Although Eutychus is never present, um, where he's not presented as anything but a victim of natural weaknesses. The Bible is clear that many of us can be present yet absent at the same time. We can go through the motions of religion and life. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't change anything. We're just going through the motions. Jesus hints at this in John chapter 9. My favorite story perhaps in the whole Bible, certainly in the four Gospels. So John chapter 9, Jesus heals the blind man. I love the story because the blind man is a smart aleck, right? He just gives it to him. Love it. But the story is all about how the blind see and the seeing are blind. And Jesus mentions that. And he says, I'm the light of the world. And some of you can't even see the light, right? And one of the responses is, um, is well, you're not talking about us, are you, Jesus? Jesus says, if you were blind, you'd have no guilt. You see how the blind see? If, if you were blind, you wouldn't have any guilt. But now that you say, we see, guess what, y'all? Your guilt remains. You're present. But you're missing out. So just as being Jewish didn't make you a child of God, so too literally seeing doesn't mean you can, you can spiritually see. Likewise, going through the motions of religion doesn't make us holy. Our church record doesn't make us good Christians. I grew up with the saying that standing in the garage doesn't make you a car. But sitting in the church pew doesn't make you a Christian. It's incredible how often we can be present and still miss the work of God in our life. To see what God is doing in our midst. And Eutychus warns us of that. We can be present, but still miss out. The third thing I think we see here. God restores and bring us, brings us in. The order of the story, I think, is significant. We've already hinted at it. Usually what we find is that the deceased in these stories of resuscitation are outside the faith community. So Elijah raises the Gentile widow's son. Right? She's outside the faith community. Jesus raises the centurion servant who's outside the faith community. But what we have here is the opposite. Eutychus is an active participant of the, of the church youth group. Yet he falls. Yet he fails. Everyone sees it in the church, right? It's the life of the local church. Everyone was aware. Everyone knew what was happening. And what was the response of this church? I noticed three things. First, remorse. They were sorrowful about what happened. As, as any of us would have been. A real tragedy or miss. We're going to run and see what happened. And, 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 and someone died. This is a reason for mourning. So we see remorse among the church. But we also see repair. Repair. Paul goes down. He raises him from the dead. And then the third part of the story with Eutychus falling is restoration. Notice that Eutychus is part of those who break bread. And listen for Paul, to Paul a little longer. I'm sure he's more awake, right? But so we see remorse. We see repair. We see restoration. That is what the church does to someone in their midst who has fallen. But in my experience of church life, from the time I was in my mother's womb, has actually usually been the opposite. Usually whenever one of us fall and we commit public sin. The church typically responds first with anger, secondly with exclusion, and thirdly with abandonment. 
You usually have the opposite response. Though. Now, one of these is a gospel response. That the church together runs to the person who has fallen, seeking the work of grace again in their lives. But too often, we just isolate ourselves from those who have done things that offend us, done things that are wrong. If only we would see ourselves as a church that restores the fallen. And not just point out that they are fallen. I can't help but think about how many people over the last century or so have abandoned the local church in their moment of greatest need when they need to see the beauty of grace. The last thing I think we see here is the importance of keeping watch. After this scene, Paul leaves Troas and he travels to Ephesus. And there he meets with the church. He has a lot to say, particularly to the elders of the church of Ephesus. Chapter 20, verse 28 is significant here. And here's he's talking to the elders. Verse 28 says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Now, let me just add a theological note here. The, the word elders and overseers... Um, and even the word pastor is, is used interchangeably in the New Testament. Three different words, but they're used interchangeably. And we know that biblically because Paul uses these words interchangeably in chapter 20. He'll use all three words of this passage with, with the Ephesian elders. Uh, and actually, in verse 28, he uses two of those words, overseers and elders. Um, so that's free. has nothing to do with our text. That's just a free theological footnote for you. Now, if you're reading the NIV, yours didn't say, pay careful attention. What does it say? Keep watch. Keep watch over yourselves and keep watch over the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, made you elders, pastors. The term is often translated in the New Testament as beware. All these translations are perfectly fine. Translated beware, translated keep watch, translated, translated pay careful attention. Ultimately, what we need to see is it is a call to action. It means to stay awake, to beware, pay attention, keep watch. See, we are at our weakest when we're not paying attention to what it is that's going on around us. In sports, I've discovered uh, that, that you are at your weakest when you just score. You ever notice that? You, you get that monster dunk, right? And all the boys are over like, yeah, high five, chest bump, yeah, we the man. All of a sudden, the other team's down the other end of the court. They're dunking. What are they doing? Oh, yeah, we the man now. Come, yeah, right? All that sort of stuff, right? Because I watch a lot of soccer. This is a real issue with soccer is, is, is you work so long to get that goal, and you get so excited, you let your guard down. Or you might think, well, we're a goal up. It took us you know, 60 minutes to get that goal. It's going to take another 60 to get another goal, so the game will be over with by then. We can let our guard down. What happens? They score on us. We're at our most vulnerable at moments of, 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 of great success. In baseball, the most important thing in the sport, particularly when you're batting, is to keep your eye on the ball. The difference between the good hitters and bad hitters <laughs> is those who keep their eye on the ball. So what Paul is saying here, to the church, keep watch. And I don't think it's an accident that after he, he tells a story about a young man who falls asleep, we read about Paul warning the church to stay awake, to keep watch, to be aware. It's a call to action. There is deep concern that too many Christians Therefore, have a settled faith. We are going through the motions of religion without ever being watchful, watchful. And as a result, we are vulnerable at such moments. when We take our eyes off the ball. So the question then for us in application is, are we saturating ourselves with the word of God? Are we engaging in regular prayer? Are we consistently obedient to the word of God? Do we seek ways to serve Christ? Are we open to others about our faith? Do we watch our own doctrine? Are we staying awake? See, it's very possible, on the one hand, to be present. On the other hand, to simultaneously be absent. So may you, as Paul told the Ephesian elders, keep watch, stay awake. First and foremost, over your doctrine and over your lives. But the good news of the story is you and I will fall. So though we can try to stay awake, sometimes we do fall asleep. And great tragedy often follows. But the good news of the gospel is 
that in Christ there is remorse, there is repair, and there is restoration. Let's pray. Our Father, I ask that you would be so kind as to help us to stay awake, to be alert, to keep watch, to pay careful attention. So, Lord, as we look at our own lives, look at our church, may we be ever watchful of our doctrine and of our lives. So maybe there are some of us here who are struggling with falling. Will you pick us back up? May we as a church struggle with thinking that we have a tendency to, to push people away who have fallen. Would you convict us of this time? May we be the sort of church that we find at Troas. Quick to mourn, quick to repair, quick to restore. That is the power of grace in our lives. Convict us in the time of invitation, we pray. Amen. Let's see. Let's see.